I have said on our show more often than not that a horror film or any film project, uh, video game, uh, entertainment industry always is not truly complete unless it's got a cool musical background, score, soundtrack, all of the above. It really ties everything together. And right now, super excited to have with us a guy who does that very thing, ties in uh, that final component for any scary viewing experience. He is a musical composer. The horror film that is just coming out available for you to check out is called Don't Look Back. Mr. Chris Thomas is with us. How you doing, man? Good. It's good to be with you. Thanks for having me on the show. Definitely good to have you. And uh, you know, don't look back. Any you know, any musical element to any of uh, a horror film, especially, I think, is so vital for the scary factor. But. Uh, where did you kind of get involved in doing musical, uh, you know, accompaniment? Because I've in looking at your website, uh, you've done quite a bit of different things. Film is Don't Look Back. You have gotten to uh, compose the musical background for it. I've gotten to listen to a couple of tracks that they uh, sent me ahead of time when the, the soundtrack went back. But man, any horror film really like if you take like Carpenter's score of Halloween off it's just like Michael Myers is just some creepy guy in a mask but you add that that classic score and it's one of the scariest movies of all time so how was this getting to uh, to do this for Don't Look Back for you adding that element to the film yeah it's a blast I, I love movies like this because um you just get to hold tension all the time it's one of those it's one of those genres where i'm very aware of my effects on the audience i know exactly what i'm doing what kind of scare i'm setting up and how i'm pacing it out um so uh, it's one of those genres where i feel extra interactive with the viewer uh, because i know what's coming up but when i look around a theater i know everyone else doesn't and my favorite of those is, is knowing I'm misleading the audience from a setup that's going to be really scary uh, once they think everything's going to be fine. And uh, being, being part of that uh, or having that power, sort of like how the director has the power to set that scare up is, is a lot of fun. Yeah, it's funny coming out of film school, one of the things that you get to download when you're making you know, the short 10-minute film projects and stuff is like, packs like audio packs mm -hmm. and so like there's like the the uh, horror pack that i have i have used where it's it's got like the you know stingers of uh you know that slow violin rise and then like all that kind of different things that you like you just said you're shaping do you yeah. um when you're doing that stuff when you're composing the different elements to those like the slow burn the dramatic rise with the startle scare at the end and all that stuff i would imagine for you you got to be like hearing that as you're like mentally watching the film at the same time like are you getting pieces of the movie well ahead of scoring it or are you trying to like lay down music just based off pages yeah, um, yeah. There's there's two parts I have for that answer um, to, to each of your each part of that question. Um, first of all, I guess I'll, I'll do it in chronological order. Sure. Um, I do this really annoying thing to all filmmakers, uh, whether it's thriller, horror, drama, uh, romance, whatever. Is um, especially when I first work with them, the first conversation that comes up is great. We're going into production soon. Then several months after we're done shooting, the film will be edited and you can start to work on it. I said, we'll send you a script and start thinking of ideas. And I do this thing that all filmmakers hate, which is I say, I ask politely if, if I cannot read the script. And I usually preface it by saying, you know what? You're not going to like what I say, but please hear me out. And they're like, okay, we're, we're listening. We have an open mind. And I say, I prefer not to read the script. And I say, great, we're trying not to freak out, so why not? And um, for me, 
when I read a script, the, my imagination begins to fill in what's going to happen, what the movie will look like, how right. a character performs, the depth of a shot, the kind of coloring, um, all these things that when the filmmaker makes the movie they see, it's nothing like how I imagined it. And my problem is I begin to hear music during that imaginative process. And then when I then I have a hard time breaking away five months or six months later when I'm actually scoring the film. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to see the first assembled cut where it's like, oh, this is the rhythm of the edit. That tells me a lot about what the music's going to do. These are the color shadings they're really leaning on through the film. That tells me a lot about which parts of the orchestra, high, mids, lows, I'm going to lean in. Um, then just the performances themselves have a sort of rhythm. And I try to radiate, let that stuff radiate off the screen and tell me what the music should do. And so the, the more connected I am at first glance to the reality of the film in front of me, the, the more accurately I tend to score the movie. So That's really cool as far as the sense that I can see coming from like my strong suits were editing and mm -hmm. like that whole area. And then, you know, second, second areas would be, I would say like the writing and pre-production process. Okay. Yeah. And so having like the lay, the layout is, you know, when you're directing it yourself and then you're having to do everything yourself when you're in school, as you know, so right. you get bits and pieces of it all, but to be able to, lay that out completely fresh um, is pretty is a pretty interesting thing because I'm thinking to myself like to edit that to edit a film without reading the script before would be really 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 difficult that's bad yeah so, yeah to score it without seeing anything and you're you know you're scoring it on first impression that's really impressive like going in blind and then just kind of jumping head over heels and however you, you know, your mind seems to envelop into the world. That's, that's a pretty cool artistic technique you have built there, man. Yeah. Not all composers are like that. Uh, some of them really begin to jam out music during the script phase when the screenplay is pretty much done. They begin to have a sense for what the movie is in terms of like story and structure and feel in the most general sense. Yeah. Um, but I find film music is so intricately linked to the dynamic of the picture itself. You can write whatever you want based on how a story concept works, but every time I've done it, I put it up against picture when the picture is finally shot yeah. and it just ruins everything on screen. And so I think I, I thought, you know, the composer probably should just read what the filmmaker created um, because, because you know, the, the speed you might apply tempo wise to a scene um, may not apply to the kind of scene it was shot. I may have seen something as more exciting and I felt a much quicker tempo, but the scene that played out was exciting, but heavier and maybe the edit had a little more space in there. And so my quick speed just walked all over the scene. And so I think to my mind, the reality is in the movie and I need to give the filmmaker the control to push the music in the right direction. I feel like that's part of my surrendering process to serving the picture rather than my, myself. So. It was don't look back. You know, I haven't seen, gotten to see a whole lot for this film yet. I've seen the, you know, mm -hmm. the promo, the promo art, the, you know, the poster that, you know, the logo with the, the bird that looks mm -hmm. creepy, very like Edgar Allan Poe vibe to him. Yeah. And uh, then, as I mentioned, you know, listening to your couple tracks, so taking in you know the the art attached to to your music, like the vibe that I get is very like uh, old school horror, like almost like a slow burn, like mm -hmm. could be supernatural. Like I, you know, a lot of questions still to be answered. Is like that's exactly mm -hmm. it. Um, can you kind of allude to any kind of the, the vibe besides the music in your, yeah. in your track that, you know, the, the fans can expect with this one that you've gotten to check out, obviously, as you scored it, like this, uh, this, this sub genre type of a, of a horror film, or is it, would you think as a, a film fan that it's like a main 
you know, like a, a conjuring type thing, or is this more of like a niche, a niche, uh, scary story? What would you describe it as? Oh, well, it's it's funny. I I've been I, I tend to veer away from scoring just straight horror films. Like I enjoy movies like saw you know mm -hmm. i love just the crazy i mean as a fan i i love all the different horror subgenres they all give us something different to to experience but um as a composer you know the real heavy torture porn stuff doesn't give you a lot of musical leeway to do much and yeah. so I, and i'm looking to exercise all of my abilities in as many different ways as possible and when jeffrey asked me about this film I was like, well, I don't know, horror, I, I do a lot of it, or I have done a lot of it. And throughout the year, I do a lot of uh, theme park work in, in the horror vein too. And so I, I get it all out of my system. Um, and he was like, well, here's, he's like, no, I, I get your concern, but here's why I'm asking you to do this. He was like, this, he's like, this story is definitely more of a, a thriller supernatural film. And he was like, to me, the heart of the story is also something of a drama. He was like, it's much more character centered than my other movies. Um, and he wanted to differentiate that this movie had a different kind of heart to it. Like there were ca characters you're really going to grow and connect with over the course of the movie, but it's very supernatural, always creepy. And of course it's Jeffrey Reddick. There's going to be a lot of scares too. Um, yeah. This is Jeffrey. But, um, and so that sold me. I love the scares. I love supernatural and thriller genres a lot because um, there's a lot of musical uh, things you can do with that. Right. Um, but the heart of it is also a drama. And so that meant we're going to have big themes and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, or, and I, I was ready to go full synth and something much more modern. He was, and then he, he steered me back away from that saying, you know, I would actually rather go a little more timeless. He was like, we could be pretty scary with all the stuff you can do. Let's invent some new sounds, go bang around on some things and record some weird stuff for the movie. But he was like, I, I do want a big thematic tune for the main mm. character, then other sub themes for other characters. We're going to develop it like a classic score. And uh, he was like, that's why I wanted you for this. You tend to specialize in big dramas. So uh, let's put the horror and the drama together. How big of a, how big of a uh, assembly did you have at one time putting this together then? Oh, geez. Um, this one, it was a combination of a lot of my own home recording and small groups of vocalists. And at any, at any, I think the biggest moment was I, I would get groups of six and 10 string players together at a time to layer in stuff over the mock-ups. Uh, we didn't want a full massive orchestra. Right. But I sweetened in a lot of uh, synth beds and had the strings double layers over it. And then I had a smaller group just doing sound effects all the time. So, uh, you know, turning, if they were playing on a cello, they'd turn their bow upside down and start clacking on the strings. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I got inside a grand piano and smashed around with a hammer, uh, had various vocalists come in and make weird noises that I manipulated with synthesizers and stuff like that. That's really cool, and it's cool to see that you are able to do that in 2020, where production has forever been changed. Yes, it's interesting to see that because we've had, you know, as Hollywood and the film industry all over has started to kind of open back up, we've been fortunate to talk to people from like all over the different aspects of the industry like makeup, direction, acting, mm -hmm. now composing. And everybody has now kind of, you know, the plan may not be set in stone, but there's definitely like that new plan that is formulated over yeah. the closure so that everyone can kind of progressively go back to work, you know, as this thing gets figured out more and more going on. So in a film like this, that is cool to see that you, you know, were able to take what you already had, A, but now it'll, B and C is you're using these smaller groups and then you can, you know, layer them in with the, the audio, audio and the music editing software. That's makes it that much more friendly for our current yeah. circumstances. Um, now you mentioned themed entertainment. I saw on your website, you did have a, a like a theme park mm -hmm. uh, thing, 
but man, you've mentioned, you know, our, you know, five favorite things, lifelong things. You know, you take the wife and the parents out of it. They're the default winners. But everyone listening to us to, to our channel knows our favorite thing is Halloween. And, you know, our haunt season uh, podcast has pretty much dominated the channel, understandably. You mentioned, uh, you know, Saw. Uh, we just did one of the, the Saw escape room in Las Vegas, actually. Oh, which cool. Was, which was pretty wild. And Perfect escape room theme, too. It's like yes. it was made to be an escape room. Yeah. But what, what would you say is your favorite uh, haunt, whether you got to go to it this year or not, that you have attended as a fan and then one that you have composed for? Oh, gosh. Um Sadly, this has been my slowest summer ever for new haunt scores because mm. um, all the productions have just shrunk in right. and featuring music is becoming less of a thing, just at least for this season. Um, and so uh, a lot of my arrangements have been, I've written stuff for several parks, but it's, it's been small little feature tracks uh, that have mostly been useful to them in the form of advertising music. Hmm. So like it'll be featured in the show, but it doubles as something they can advertise with. So they get their money's worth out of it because um, it won't be that noticeable in, in a drive through show. You know, right. so um, let's see uh, what gosh. Oh, there's so many favorites to visit, you know, in Los Angeles. Um, I've always been a really big fan of delusion and uh, creep uh, John and Justin. Uh, gosh, I am like their biggest fans. <laughs> like I, I really, really freak out every time I, I, I go see their shows. They're just absolutely brilliant. And in fact, Justin and I were about to work on something this year and uh, his, you know, his venue was closed and uh, he was, he's, he's, he's been, he was able to launch a new show for Halloween, but um, not the kind of show we were, looking forward to doing <laughs> we had a giant theater downtown los angeles booked out for this great walkthrough experience that uh, is no more but um uh but yeah john braver and the delusion was just that's just one of my all-time favorites and i and i've i've been in the last 10 years los angeles haunted hayride has always been a favorite and it's it was always my home so it was the first themed entertainment show that ever hired me and I was already like their biggest fan in the world. And I couldn't believe I was writing for them. Um, and uh, yeah, I've always just loved that show too. So yeah, that that's interesting that you're, you're throwing some major names out there that I know people who listen to our show will know, but mm. it, it sounds like you, you know, when you're talking about creep and delusion and even yeah. haunted hayride, you know, speaking for last year, you like that. It sounds like the haunt experience where you are, you're getting some like interactivity with the characters and stuff. Cause creep and delusion. Those were, I mean, that, that's not a Halloween horror nights experience. That's a, you go to a location and you're essentially thrust into like a, a stage performance. It's very personalized too. And like with Justin, the algorithm kind of changes based on what choices you make sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gets a little intense uh, and personal. Yeah. Those are the, those productions, you know, are are very cool. Creep usually spells out ex extraordinarily fast. Yeah. Uh, once they post their tickets online, but it's always you know whether or not I've done it, I've gotten to go to two of them, and every time I see an announcement that I'm like, dang, it's like it's like a novel series. Like he's developed yeah. his own franchise. He really has. It's cool. The uh, you know the film industry with you know your work and you know you, you mentioned you know, jeffrey who is the director of don't look back you know he's most notably for me you know he is attached to final destination movie oh yeah that's how i know him yeah and uh, you know the the array of horror movies that sound can depict differently or the same or you know the different categories that exist for horror films are just as vast as the, the film itself when it comes to music where, you know, I know you've done other genres as you've mentioned, but like the, the romantic 
uh, movies or an action movie. Um, a lot of music, at least as a viewer to me, like when I hear or when I go to a movie, like a romance movie, like a lot of the musical accompaniment that kind of all goes in like one one vein, I guess is for lack of a better term, where yeah. where yeah. with horror, and it's the same thing, you know, you have like your supernatural, you have a monster, you have um, like something crazy, like Freddy versus Jason or Evil Dead. Like you have like a vast amount of possibilities. Not saying that you don't have a vast amount in the other genres other to draw from, but coming from... Yeah. I mean, coming from, I mean, we're about a week away from what we call is the, you know, the coldest month of the year viewership wise for us, because this is, we're dawning upon the time of the year where the wife and uh, my mother and mother-in-law all, you know, throughout uh, Central California respectively, but the bubble isn't big enough for, I'm sure, many of husbands to feel a Hallmark Channel uh, marathons vastly approaching us here yeah <laughs> and uh the uh i don't you know there's nothing wrong and believe me like i don't people will ask me to review films and i won't post a review anymore unless i really loved it because i don't want to i don't want to shit on it because i know yeah. how hard it is to make it and so right. it's like so i know how hard equally it has to be to compose music. So it's like, I don't want to say like, well, every romance movie has the same kind of music. Like you just got to do the same thing as the Oscar. But when I'm sitting down and I'm like looking at a, a, you know, instead of a DVD case of films to watch, I'm looking at a case of CDs to draw from. I guess there's a whole lot more variety to get to pull from on the horror shelf than the romance shelf. Mm -hmm. So with, with writing music for you, is there a genre that you know you when you get the job you're like man i get to really like go to the sandbox and and mess around with this one type of a thing is that the horror genre for a composer or is it something else yeah um well that's that's a fascinating question i've never really thought of it in those terms, but I've thought of something like this before yeah. and it will more or less end up validating your point or your theory here because um, you're, you're right about, I think, I think you're right about cinema genres in general. Um, mm -hmm. They exist after all. And when you're answering to a network or a studio, <laughs> they do need to sell the movies right. and, they, they, right. and it needs to work and be, something needs to be expected for a wider audience to, to, to go in, to have the courage to buy into it. And so there's something to be said for that. And with some genres, they're a little more limited than others. You get, you know, like from Hallmark through like the rom-com genre, right. you tend to find a really narrow bandwidth of sound. The, the music isn't, it's an important thing to keep the film moving. You need little themes to inter identify with characters and such, but, right. but that genre comes with a lot of baggage and a lot of expectation. People aren't looking to be shocked and surprised. Um, now it's like you go to drama does have a really wide band. Um, Cause you can combine drama with thriller, supernatural, even horror to an extent. But um, so drama you can do, all kinds of stuff you could do like fantasy futuristic you could do period pieces you can do uh, swashbuckling stuff yeah i mean th there's a rather wide playing field but horror is really one of those genres where people are also are, are expecting to be shocked a bit mm -hmm. they go in not never quite knowing what they're buying into and so it's like well which horror movie are you going to see like a, that has a score that's like The Shining uh, mm -hmm. or like something really classy, you know, like Exorcism of Emily Rose uh, with Chris right. Young and which is a great scary movie, but it's a great drama and courtroom movie. So yeah. it's great cinema, Silence of the Lambs, scary as fuck, but great drama, just yeah. excellent cinema craft. And so it's, it's, it's kind of combining forces with stuff. And then 
you know, and this room to be really scary and this room to be very dramatic. So, and, and, oh, and then, you know, let's talk about like Ari Aster films, you know, <laughs> from Midsummer or, uh, or take another film like The Witch. It's like, none of these soundtracks and styles have anything to do with one another musically. They're all so different and vast. Some are just pure horror. Some are drama and a little scary. Some are drama and very scary. And some are just from another universe altogether. And no one asks any questions because there's a really wide playing field you have at your disposal. So the thing about dark, quirky, horror, thriller, supernatural is you can do so much. And I love playing around in that sandbox. So. Yeah, that's really cool to hear. You know, you mentioned some of the directors that you mentioned because, mm -hmm. I mean, the last you know five years, I think the craziest horror film cinematically I've seen are Ari Aster's works. Honestly. Oh yes, Hereditary it's was. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, like that first shot to <laughs> of the dollhouse, and then you know she walks in the door and you're like, my God, it's a natural bedroom. Yeah. That I don't think is as, I mean, it's visually very uh, off putting, but that slow draw in with mm -hmm. that slow music that accompanies, like you mentioned, that is something uh, that makes that all the more throughout that whole film. Same with Midsommar. I mean, the dude yeah. I want to have a coffee table conversation with him because the dude has got some, some stuff going on upstairs that he, <laughs> yeah. he, he's pulling his horror stories from some deep rooted like stuff. He knows how to really just kind of invade visually. Yeah. And then the music it invades, you know, it, it invades audibly and it really just becomes a sensual. That really is a sensual thing. When you talk about a movie going experience, like, Mm -hmm. That is a great definition of how a film can invade your senses. Uh, his two his two works that have really you know gotten that wide distribution. But is yeah, there... and you, yeah, and you don't even need scary music per se. There wasn't a cue in like Midsummer that was actually a horror cue. No, um, right. it was. It, you know, it's like when I listen to you know the. The, the Basque composer Maurice Ravel, uh, sort of from the Impressionist era. It's like, he almost doesn't fit in with anything else in the world. Like he's just getting a signal from some other place that no one else was tapping into at the time. Right. And it's just to this day, it, there's just something a little special about that sound. When I hear a score like that, like, like this from this film, it's like, it was just pulled from something completely organic to the world of that movie and it doesn't need to be just scary music right it just tapped into what that movie needed and it accomplished the task and so um to me that's a beautiful thing just provoking horror and madness just on its own terms what that's a great uh segue to ask you another fun one what is your favorite use of a song whether it have lyrics or not not intended for horror that has been used. Oh, like, gosh. Tiptoe Through the Tulips is one that stands out to me. The mm. insidious demon, you know, as he's sitting there sewing whatever the hell it is, more red curtains for his lair or whatever. But that shot yeah. with the marionettes and Tiptoe Through the Tulips is blaring. Like, that's terrifying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's a use of a song? I know I've got one up here, up there somewhere. Wow, at the moment, I, I just can't think of it. Let's just go with that one, because that's pretty yeah. good. <laughs> that's a great scene. I mean, now, I mean, the last, the last, most recently, I, you know, Bone Thugs, I got five on it when they remixed that for us. Oh, wow. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a, uh, a uh, audible stinger that they slowed you know, way down to just give it that creepy tone. That was, yeah. You know, I mean, Horror and music, man, ever since, you know, the great Dracula, you know, Universal Monsters movies, they've right. just gone hand in hand. But what what was it? Uh, I usually lead in with this, but I will, I will close with this. What was it, you know, musically or cinematically that got you, man, to the point where you were like, I, this is, I want to make music for films or I want to compose music in general. What, what was it that really led you on that path? Yeah. I, 
I was a I was a little kid when I just fell in love with music. I was I remember I was in second grade when I just decided to practice piano obsessively. And I just knew it, it was going to be with me forever. And, and a little later, uh, I remember I was in fifth grade when I just decided I was going to be a composer. And I, I, as a kid, I fell in love with the classics, you know, like Beethoven and Vivaldi. And, but I just didn't see what a future looked like. And, um, and, it, and, and I was listening to film scores, too, at the time. I, I remember listening to Jurassic Park, E.T., uh, Oh gosh, uh, a bunch of James Horner scores at that time too. Um, and there's just so many wonderful film composers in that era who really inspired me, but I just thought like, I don't know if I sound like these people. Then in the same year I discovered, um, I, I, I realized I was a really big fan of Alfred Hitchcock and um, uh, Federico Fellini and some of these really great. Later on, I'd learned that they were like the you know the Beethoven and Mozart of cinema, and, right. and, I, and I, I, I picked my influence as well. I just didn't know it at the time, and I began to notice names attached to it. And I thought, who's this Bernard Herrmann guy scoring all these Alfred Hitchcock movies? All my favorite Hitch films tend to have this composer attached. And then, um, not long after that. I discovered, uh, uh, I remember Nightmare Before Christmas came out and that was my first contact with Danny Elfman as a film composer. And the first thing I ever learned about him a little while after that was he was obsessed with Bernard Herrmann too. And I mm. thought, oh, I I get these people. Like, I think I'm on that, that wavelength. Whatever mm. Herrmann was doing with Hitchcock and whatever Elfman's doing with Burton, I, I, I'm beginning to see a through line of like weird madness. And see, same with... Fellini and Nina Rota, his composer, there was a weird, I mean, Nina Rota was a fascinating imagination. And I felt like there was this weird, quirky, circusy, otherworldly thing that just felt like home to me. Mm. And I thought, you know what? Film is where it's at. Because I, I was becoming just as much obsessed with cinema as I was music at the time. But I knew music was by far my strength. And so I just stuck with it. But yeah, it was um, that intersection of things that showed me the light to a future where I thought, you know, if I do this music thing, that's probably how I'm going to survive. And and ultimately I did believe in it. It wasn't like, oh, it's just an interest. I, I I knew if I did it or I went for it, I could probably get away with it. And here I am almost 40 and I'm still getting away with it. So for now. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And we, you know, looking at some of the films that we know that you have worked on, I mean, your work is, is really well, uh, Thank you. Really well composed, for lack of a better term, for a musical composer. But it, uh, you know, it really does. It, you know, I think every job of every department when it comes to filmmaking is to uh, assemble their department's work in a complementary manner to the right. film as a whole. And, you know, the films that you have worked on, I would say that the music absolutely complements the entire package of the film and we look forward to uh looking at don't look back man the cool. you know without you know going based off of your music the fact that jeffrey is directing it the tracks like i said that they allowed us to check out along with the the promo it looks you know in your description today the film looks really uh right up our alley that cool. not necessarily a straight up paranormal film, but definitely one that dives into that uh, subgenre of horror with some other right. elements, suspenseful and dramatic elements as well. I'm stoked to check it out, man. But where, before we let you go, can everybody kind of check you out, keep tabs to see what you uh, have got in the, in the works? Yeah, I say just go to christhomasmusic.com. And you'll be able to see what I'm up to there. Just be sure not to click on the top secret tab. Oh, okay. So there you go. To <laughs> but ChrisThomasMusic.com. Chris, man, thank you so much for taking the time out. Uh, and we will definitely uh, have to have another one of these conversations in the future. Yeah, it'd be great. It was so nice meeting you. And thanks again for the invite. It was great chatting today.